Good morning, everyone. Did you enjoy breakfast? The chia pudding? It's like dessert, but healthy. Um, the croissants. Croissants, I feel like, are kind of rare to find vegan. But then I said that to someone from Adelaide, and she said, no, actually, we're just ahead of the times so here. We see that all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's always so fun to just have a bit more of an intimate gathering with everybody. Um, and yeah, the vibes are always good. It's a good way to start the second day of the Vegan Festival. Yesterday was so much fun. Um, what did you think of the new venue? It's good? Yeah. yeah, I thought it was really good as well. Um, just like spread it out more and the vibes were chill and the shade is a thing that people would usually complain about, so less complaints, which is nice for the organizers, I'm sure. Uh, we're all just going to talk for about 10 minutes about um, whatever it is we want to talk about, I guess. Um, and I'm first on the sheet. So I thought what I would do is um, talk about an experience I had just a week or so ago. Um, and the reason is because it's so easy, I think, to, um, you know, we're all vegan, obviously. Um, and we all have our reasons. And generally, I think for probably everybody here and almost any vegan I meet, our main reason is because of what's happening to animals and that we don't want it to happen to animals. Um, that it's wrong for it to be happening. Uh, I think it's always good to get a, not always good, I think from time to time it's good to get a really solid uh, reminder of the reality to fuel your fire, um, to remind you of the urgency of the situation and to hopefully inspire you to uh, be active in your day-to-day -day life in whatever way that you find suits you so that we can all do our part as the only people, you know, all vegans, the only people who really see it um, the way that it is and see the solution the way that it needs to be. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to talk about an experience I had a week or so ago in some slaughterhouses in Bali. Um, I hope I didn't talk too long. I'm not sure. All right. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I've been an animal rights activist for nearly six years. Six years in January it'll be. And I've never had the opportunity to be in a slaughterhouse, which is the main thing I talk about and have been talking about for the last six years. I've been inside a few slaughterhouses, but never when they were killing or just after they killed. Um, it's just extremely hard to have that opportunity in Australia or the USA or the UK or Canada. So we found out that we did have that opportunity in Bali. I have a friend there who speaks fluently the language. Um, we told the locals that, the, the local people um, who run the slaughterhouse, that we were uh, students of you know, the, a similar type of um, you know, agriculture and slaughterhouses and this and that. And we'd just like to come and see how it's done. So we <coughs> went at about 1 a.m., um, three nights in a row. And for the first time in my six years as a vegan, as an animal rights activist, I was there while they were killing the innocent animals right in front of me. And documenting this uh, on my social media accounts, um, right up close, you know, I, f I find that as we all probably see, a lot of the footage that we see is hidden cameras, um, investigators with hidden cameras, and it was a reasonably unique, from what I've seen, situation to be able to blatantly observe and film and document um, the goings on inside of this building. Um, there were very few things that were different over in Bali to what happened in Australia. Mainly it was just hygiene related. The people there weren't even wearing shoes, some of them. There was literally organs and pools of blood and just, you know, the most filthy, filthy, disgusting floor you could imagine. They're not wearing shoes, some of them. They just don't care. Um, some of them have been doing this job every night for 40 years. And to be in a place like that, um, to witness this true horror, you know, true horror, to see these, these, for example, the pigs that I saw, just 
fighting every last moment, just desperately trying to escape in a place where there is absolutely no escape. Um, being being forced forward into the tiny box where, you know, is the end of the road for them. And just seeing how badly they don't want to go there, how scared they are. Um, what, a, what a horrible life they've already had. And these pigs are just five-month-old babies. And for them to be forced into this box. And then for this man to um, use those electric tongs over the, first of all, it's, from the um, from part of the head to the heart, where they hold it there in the electrocute them, and then they move it to the head to um, finish that part of the process. And yeah, so they um, yeah saw them do that to hundreds of pigs. It was uh, just so so incredibly. Um, What's the word? It's hard to find words, actually. There's not that many words that really do justice of what it was. But I think hell comes close, actually. Um, although that's almost a fictional place. But I feel like for those beings, it was a total reality. You know, I can't imagine it, it, hell being much worse than what they were going through. It was just fear and terror and pain and suffering right until the last moment um, of your murder, of being murdered. It was just absolutely horrific. And um, on the third night that I was there, <coughs> so, so let me just tell you a bit more. So first, like they do the electrocution. Then, just like in Australia, they shackle them upside down. They stab them in the throat um, with a long, probably twelve-inch blade. Some of the animals are still conscious during this part, just like in Australia. Then they're swung around into the scalding tank. Some of the con animals are still conscious at even this part, um, where they drown. This is just standard. This is just what happens to get a, a live animal who doesn't want to die to become chopped up into pieces. There's a, there's a lot of force. There's a lot of, obviously, uh, extremely violent abuse. And um, on the third night, I asked uh, the, the, uh, the guy who was stunning the pigs, he said to me, um, are you an animal lover? You know, because I was just there. Like, there was a lot of the process that I wasn't that interested in. I felt like the most powerful footage that could actually lead to killing. And, uh, you know, by this point, I was already pretty much ready to leave. I was actually covered in the scalding tank water um, just from trying to get footage of that. So I just felt disgusting. And I said to him, yeah, I am, actually. And he said, I thought so. And then... I just sort of sat there for a bit and I said, are you an animal lover? This is the guy like smacking the pigs to get them into this box and then um, electrocuting them. He said, yeah, I am. I said, wow, it must be a really hard job for you to do. And he said, I hate this job, but this is all I can do. I've been doing this for four years every night. This is all I can do. I said, well, man, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope one day you find a way to uh, do something different. Um, and... That is just the reality of the world. Um, this is how it's done, here, there, everywhere. Most people are animal lovers, even slaughterhouse workers, some of them, like this guy, for example, who can see themselves animal lovers, just doing their job, just to get by, feed their family. You know, they're not the problem. Um, but the problem is solvable um, through helping people make the connection with the choices that they're making and the victims of those choices. Um, the, this particular experience I was able to share on my social media, about half a million people watched it. And um, you know, it's hard to get people to watch graphic cruelty. You know, if I just post a photo of, a, of an animal being slaughtered or of a documentary or of a clip or this and that, it gets a few views. Like it gets some views. It's still powerful, of course, extremely powerful. I think there was something especially powerful about a vegan being inside a slaughterhouse and filming, filming so blatantly. I think that's part of the reason why half a million people watched it and also part of the reason why probably thousands of people um, responded directly to me from that footage inspired to make changes in their life. Um, and that's the beauty of it, that although the solution is so horrific, uh, sorry, although the problem is so horrific, 
and um, you know, there's so much work to be done. The typical nature of people, even slaughterhouse workers, is that they are good people and they are compassionate and they do love animals and there's just some connections there that are missing that people like us have the responsibility, the duty and the ability to help them connect or reconnect with being kind to all beings, to show them the delicious vegan alternatives that are currently available, that are growing every single day, to show people and prove through the information out there and also our own personal journeys, how healthy it can be, how enjoyable it is to make this switch in your life, how transformative it is. And ultimately, one day, hopefully soon, we will be much further down the path and much closer to a vegan world. So I just wanted to share that story with you all, just to remind you, you know, it's, it's a vegan festival. Like, it's the food, it's good, it's the vibes, they're high. Um, but I think also every now and then, not every day, maybe, um, but every now and then it's just really good to remember what veganism is all about. It's not about the cupcakes, although they're good. It's, it's about ending this horrific injustice and doing everything we can to do that and realizing that we have the power to do that. What we know is so valuable, the connection we've made is so important and to share that um, in all the ways possible is our duty. So thank you so much. All right, so next up on the Mizzy Wizzy microphone, um, we have Hans. I always wonder, is it Siva? Saiva, I never knew how to pronounce it. I see it written all the time. Hans Saiva. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to Hans. Thank you. Everyone says that. Uh, everyone thinks I'm a boy too. <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess um, thanks for that, James. Um, quite sad to witness all of that. Um, I've been in the chicken sheds and all that before, uh, but I don't think I'd have the uh, the guts to go and do what you just did. Well, that's very important work. But um, I can tell you more stories from sort of more of an ocean side of life um, as my time with Sea Shepherd. So I uh, started out many years ago. Um, I used to own a nightclub in Melbourne and I became a licensed private investigator. And I used my license now. I was doing infidelity for a little while, chasing people with sheep. <laughs> I have a few stories about that. <laughs> but um, I, I found no value in that. So now I use my license to do undercover stuff with uh, animal rights. And I uh, managed to get some footage at a Geelong sale yard in Melbourne. And we managed to shut the sale yard down with the footage that we got. So talking to councils and stuff. But yeah. Um, but. Um, I joined Sea Shepherd when I found out about the dolphin slaughter in Taiji. Um, and then I used to protest out the front of the Japanese embassy. I had the federal police call me stuff all the time. And I covered myself in blood. And, <laughs> and we made it, it was fake blood. And, um, and I laid down on a Japanese flag in front of the Japanese embassy and um, did a protest. And now I know that's politically incorrect. Um, I didn't know about Sea Shepherd at the time. <laughs> I was a very angry vegan for a long time. This is going back nine years ago, so I've been vegan now for nine years, which is um, waiting for my 10th anniversary. Yay! And then, um, yeah, and then I found out about Sea Shepherd, and I joined them, and pretty much never looked back. I shut the doors of my nightclub and walked away. Lost all my money. Didn't care. Still don't care to this day. It means no. It's of no value to me. And um, the the best campaign I ever did out of the I did 10 campaigns in six years. I literally went from ship to ship. So I just would fly from Africa, to off the Ocean Warrior, I think, to the Sea Vu and to back to Africa, back to the Sea Vu, and it was constant. So I'm a little bit exhausted, of course. So I'm taking a year off at the moment, which is why I could commit to this event, finally. Um, but the best campaign I did was Operation Ice Fish. Um, we actually went down to Antarctica. I was on the Bob Barker for this, and um, we sent two ships down, the Bob Barker and the... Uh, Sam Simon. Our job was to go in, find these six illegal poaching vessels. Um, they wanted by Interpol. And uh, it was a fleet of six that owned by Spanish mafia called the Dalamadoras. And the core crew inside these ships 
are these people from Indonesia who are just looking for work. And this is where the human trafficking gets involved in this sort of um, scenario. These people are just, they have to hand over their passports and the deeds to their land to do these contracts. They're stuck on these ships for up to two years. And they are or physically abused, mentally, sexually, emotionally abused on these ships. And um, there's no women. And um, they have to do all the fish gutting and all that sort of stuff. And they don't, some of them don't see land for two years. So we went down to find these six vessels. Um, it was the first time the Japanese had decided they weren't going to go to Antarctica to do the uh, whale hunt. So we took that opportunity to go after the Patagonian toothfish hunters. Patagonian toothfish is like the white gold of the ocean. It actually um, has a lot of fat in the, in, the, in the, a lot of oil in the fat, so it's hard to burn. And in America, they call it Chilean sea bass. So I don't know if any, I had Chilean sea bass when I lived over in America. And believe me, if I'd known now, or back then what I know now, I would never have eaten it. But I probably ate Patagonian toothfish, who knows. So um, we chased this, we found that we were in Antarctica for two weeks. We found the vessel and uh, within the first two weeks we got there and then we gave chase. And we thought we were going to just go down, find the vessel, chase it out get it arrested, go back, get another one. That was the whole plan. It was supposed to be a two-month campaign. The Sam Simon, we um, rigged up the back of the Sam Simon so that we could haul in their nets. And um, so it was all really built by volunteers and people from all over the world. So this is not a purpose-built ship for hauling in nets because the equipment broke down three times in the middle of the ice and they had to weld it back together. Um, really hard work they did on the Sam, but... So we chased this vessel and in the end, um, first they took off really fast and they were yelling at us over the, over the radios and stuff and who are you and Peter was trying to give them a, you know, you're, you're under arrest sort of thing and you need to go back to Fremantle and they were like, yeah, right. So they took off and then they took them a little while to figure out who we were because they saw the skull and crossbone on the front of the, um, the jo Jolly Roger on the front of the ship and then they realised, you know, the Sea Shepherd, uh, if you find out who we are, we're not giving up, there's just no way. Plus, this, the Bob Barker used to be a whaling vessel. So where they used to keep all the whale meat, the big, huge vats, we turned it into fuel tanks. So we could go for a long time. And we've been going to Antarctica for 12 years, so there's nothing that's going to beat the Bob Barker, I can tell you that. So we gave chase, and um, it ended up being a 110-day chase. So we went through, uh, yeah, lots and lots of weather. They tried to take us in storms. They tried to take us through ice. Again, it's the Bob Barker. There's no way. With Peter Hammerstein at the helm, it's like, we're going. We're going after you. Sometimes they would go for two weeks straight just doing two knots, like this, for two weeks straight, and we just followed for two weeks straight. Oh, a lot of downtime. <laughs> a lot of, we got bought here, and then we had all packed for Antarctica, of course, so we had all our winter gear, and then we ended up around the coast of Africa and Mauritius, Madagascar around there, and with boiling, we got no winter, no summer gear, so we had to go into the free locker. All our ships have a free locker, so old crew put their stuff they don't want, new crew can come and take what they want. It's like a free-off shop. And uh, we had to start cutting up jumpers and shorts and like out of jeans and all kinds of stuff to try and survive the hot weather. No air conditioning, everyone slept in the mess. Um, yeah, <laughs> we suffered hard, but it, we still, we gave chase. We started with 27 crew on the bog, we finished with 17. So the Sam Simon had to keep coming, bringing us provisions and food and swapping crew in and out. And um, uh, 147 days later, I finally made it to Bremen, Germany. <laughs> Exhausted. But we got there. Anyway, 110 days after we ch gave chase that vessel, they sunk their own ship right in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the alarm went off at about 5 o'clock in the morning. Peter called us all to the, to the mess. And um, we are still in our jam. He's like half awake. And he's like, the ship's sinking. We're like, what? <laughs> he's, no, the thunder. It's called the thunder. The thunder is sinking. And, and we were in disbelief, and so we went straight into action, got the small boats in the water, got everyone got up, we got, in, got all the cameras out, got everything out that we needed to get out, and um, we took provisions. Um, it took them about six hours for the ship to get like that, so we waited for six hours for this thing to go down, and then it just <laughs> straight down. And uh, we had to rescue the crew, so we waited for the Sam Simon to come up. Um, they were about two hours behind us. And this, because we had been chasing this ship for so long, and they outnumbered us, there was 40 on that ship, and we were only, remember, by this stage, we might have been about 20, so, and, and half female as well. So Peter was very reluctant to bring them onto our ship, just for safety reasons, so they made a makeshift, <laughs> makeshift cell on the, on, the, on the SAM, they cut a hole in the door. And um, we rescued the crew, we, took, uh, we kept them tied together in the life rafts until 
the Sam arrived, um, the law of the sea is the first ship at the scene is the one that has to rescue the crew. And of course, when we're compassionate people, we're not going to let these people drown, especially knowing that half of them were um, part of human trafficking anyway. So we um, put them onto the Sam Simon. We put the captain of the ship, he, wasn't, he wouldn't get off the ship. We had, my, our captain was yelling at him to get off the ship and he wouldn't get off until it got to that point where we couldn't salvage it because they pulled something out in the engine room and just flooded. They tied all the doors open and they got rid of all the buoys and stuff off the deck of the ship so it was completely clean. So in the middle of the night we watched them burning stuff and we could see the plastic buoys burning and in, in, into the water. Too bizarre. Yeah, so um, we got them onto the Sam and the captain, we put him into the, <laughs> our little cell. He had a bit of a tanty, didn't like the food or water and um, in the end um, our captain Sid, Sid Chakravarti was the captain of the Sam and he had a really like, you're on my ship now, you can behave yourself. And uh, so he calmed down and um, the captain and the chief mate and the chief engineer were the only ones that had suitcases. Everyone else, no one knew that the ship was going to go down. Yeah. So we took all their um, passports and everything. We managed to get three of our crew onto their ship before it went down. We took, all, we took one of the fish to the evidence and a lot of their computers and charts and stuff of where they had been. And um, we went to the coast of Sao Tome and the Sao Tome Coast Guard we came in their little dinghy boats and their machine guns and they took a whole crew and we, they processed all the, the, uh, the core crew, the Indonesians, and then we helped Interpol to help pay for them to all go home to their families and give them back their passports. And the, um, the captain and that uh, went to jail. They caught case, hearing, everything, all that, yeah. So it was a bit, um, yeah. But the, uh, the part of the, um, the part of the, I don't want to take up too much time, so just let me know when. Um, so the Sam Simon, the work that they were doing, pulling in the nets, they hauled in one net. They only got, it took them two weeks to haul this net in. These nets are so big that the net actually snapped. And that part of the net that they got onto the ship was 72 kilometres long. Yeah. That's one part of one net. Yeah. We did donate to Parley for the Oceans and they've made shoes out of it. And uh, Yeah, they sent me a pair. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is this is what I know, and this is what we're up against. And all the animals that they put in were all dead, and and um, you can see the net cutting into their bodies, and their you know, and the scales, and and um, the, a lot of the crabs that they pulled up had egg, egg sacs on them, so they're taking out two generations. This is all the bycatch that gets caught in these nets, and this is what's happening in our oceans now. So when people say to me, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm just pescatarian, I just eat seafood, or whatever." What a load of crap that is. It really pisses me off. <laughs> Sorry, it does. It really makes me angry because it's like you don't even know what the destruction you're contributing to just because you're eating fish because you think it's okay. Aside from the mercury poisoning and the plastic that's inside seafood now, put all of that aside, the destruction that this is going through, and I've seen it from my own eyes, and I cannot, cannot stress how bad the oceans are suffering right now because of what people think it's okay and not okay. Oh, it's just fish. It's just eating fish. They suffer just as much. When they come onto the, we pulled, the, pull, we pulled another net in from some Chinese vessels that we found and I, I got to throw a blue shark back into the water. But you, when you see them coming in and they're struggling to breathe and they're flapping around and they're suffocating and because you just imagine if that's you, you know, or your dog or whatever and just people just do not understand how bad it is. But the worst, the one of the worst parts for me is also, I also know when I'm coming back to land is because I can see bottles floating in the water. So the plastic uh, pollution is is um, is terrible. So yeah, I mean I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the message is like you know when people eat seafood, just tell them that story <laughs> and try and get them to stop eating seafood. It's t it's like destruction of our ocean and everything is connected. You know people taking the, ke the kelp fish oil and kelp pills and all that whatever it does to you. That's whale food. Like stop taking whale food. You know. So yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to mix up the run sheet. Is that what we're doing with this order here? Oh, you don't even know, so don't worry. Oh, okay. You, you, got, you two sat in the wrong spot. Don't worry. I'm not mad. Um, Christy, how about you go next then? All right. So please give a round of applause to Christy Alga. Uh, hi. So I'm Christy and I was radicalised by rabbits. I think that's pretty much the only way you can describe it. Um, 
So I went vegan about seven and a half years ago and got involved with the rescue community in Tasmania. And pretty soon, my house was full of rabbits. Uh, rabbits, when it comes to needing rescue, they are one of the highest numbers of dumped and abandoned animals because people just totally misunderstand them. And so, you know, wall-to-wall -wall rabbits, building pens in my backyard, suddenly my day was taken up by, okay, who needs a vet appointment? Who's going here? Who's getting adopted out? Whose contract needs signing? All of these things. And within a year of starting actively rescuing rabbits, I found myself filming inside a rabbit fur and flesh farm uh, with a slaughter facility attached to it in Tasmania. And I was, I've touched on it briefly when I spoke at the Dominion Rally uh, in 2018. Um, a friend had gotten word, uh, she was a greyhound rescuer, and she'd gotten word of this, of this facility in northern Tasmania. And she was like, we've got to do something. It's abhorrent. You know, she'd been there just to have a bit of a suss out, pretending to be a buyer, and the conditions were horrific. And she's like, we've got to do something. So looking back, what we did was so obvious, and I've got no idea how the hell we got away with this. I borrowed a keychain from a friend that looks like a, a remote uh, car locking device. It's got a camera built into it. And put it on my keychain. And we walked in and my friend introduced me as, oh, she wants to start rabbit farming. And the shit I had to say, that just to convince these people like, oh, yeah, you know, they're cute and all, but they taste good, her, her, all that sort of crap. Meanwhile, they invite us onto the property into these sheds. And we walked from cage to cage. Why would anybody dangle a keychain into a rabbit cage? Like, literally, they'd be talking about, oh, yeah, this breeder does this and she's got this number in her litter and that and that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm just going to, you know, put my keys in the corner here. And they didn't pick up on it. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Anyway, so we, we documented rabbits um, on this suspended wire. And rabbits uh, that are bred for their flesh, it's very similar to broiler chickens. They're, they're bred to grow quickly and it really screws with their joints. So when you put them on suspended wire, their legs splay. So there are a lot of rabbits who were very splay-legged on the wire. They can't get to water, they can't eat, they can't clean themselves, their bums get filthy, they get uh, fly-blown, riddled with maggots. Underneath all the cages was just piles and piles of shit and hay that was rotting. Actually, it wasn't even hay, it was straw. And rabbits need hay, 80% of their diet needs to be hay so that their, their guts can constantly turn over. So when you give them straw, they get GI stasis, their stomachs stop, it's extremely painful and they die a horrific death. So they had a high mortality rate because these rabbits were not getting hay, they were getting shitty pellets and grains, weren't being able to get to water. And in front of us, this person, she's showing us, oh yeah, this is my best breeder, her name's Reba. And Reba was this beautiful, big, red Rex Cross um, British Giant. I've never seen a more beautiful rabbit. She had this massive dewlap and these golden and red flecks through her coat. And she had six four-week-old babies in her cage with her. And this woman says, yeah, it's about time that she had another lot. Picks Reba up out by her scruff of her neck. This is a five-kilo rabbit being held by the scruff of her neck and takes her into another shed and says, yeah, come and follow me. And in the shed, there were two tiny, tiny cages. They're about a metre squared. And there were two males in these cages. Same conditions. But the, ca the, the shed itself was really closed and stuffy. It was about a 38-degree day that day. There was no air. It was dark. There was no light. It was just awful. And this woman just dumps Reba, the rabbit, into a cage with one of the males. And we had to stand there and literally watch this rabbit flatten herself to the ground as this huge male covered her and impregnated her again. And then Reba was taken to a different cage. So her four-week-old kits were then moved into the grower cages. This is all happening in front of us. We're filming everything. So a mother was taken from her babies 
in front of us because it was time for her to produce more for the next round of the fur and the flesh that they wanted. And we stood there laughing. You know, we had to laugh along with this woman going, oh, this boy, he knows what he likes. Oh, look at him. And, and all these awful, awful, real objectifying statements. And we had to laugh along with her because we needed this footage. And then we went back into the grower pen cages she said, well, if you're going to get into rabbit farming, you're going to have to know how to kill them. And that was extremely, extremely unexpected. We weren't expecting them to show us how to do this. And she pulls this beautiful 12-week-old uh, silver rabbit out of a cage and holds up a baseball bat. And I, you, you know what happened. And... Still makes me very shaky to think about that uh, because my natural instincts were to deck this woman before she could even hit that rabbit but we couldn't because we needed to communicate with her meanwhile as all of this is happening her grandkids who are seven and nine years old are running around you know running around the cages pointing at the rabbits oh i like that one this one's so cute one of them was sitting on top of the cages playing with the knife that they used to cut the rabbit's throats. Totally normal. And anyway, so we got the footage, laughed along with them, and as part of the cover, we did have to purchase some rabbits, which my husband was really thrilled about when I came home with 12 rabbits, came crashing through the door, bawling and covered in snot. And, oh, my God. And, oh, by the way, we've got 12 more rabbits. And he's like, oh, it's so we sent all that footage through to the RSPCA because, you know, what else are you going to do? And the response, look, the, the investigator that we dealt with, she was upset, but the response was we can't do anything because everything that had been done in front of us was legal. And in fact, the cages, as small as they were, were above the mandatory size limits for rabbits. So male breeder rabbits... Uh, they have to have 0.75 metre squared cages for life. And that's it. That's, it. that's the space they get. And they don't have to ever come out of that. They don't have to feel grass ever. They don't have to see sunlight ever. That, that's the mandatory limit. And so that response from the RSPCA and knowing that the government, the DPI, weren't going to get involved in any of this, it broke any faith I have ever had and I apologise for what I'm about to say, in the political system as regards protection of non-human animals. And I'm so glad that we have people like Andy in the political realm because you are so important. But when it comes to systems and structures already in place, I have no faith in them. And I have found myself over the years becoming increasingly radicalised against not only political structures but societal structures. I find myself... I don't know if I'd describe myself as an anarchist, but I do believe I'm heading in that direction. The more I see of the world, the less impressed I am with it, the less impressed I am with the structures surrounding us. And it is directly attributable to that moment when I received the email from the RSPCA saying, there's nothing we can do. And so, yes, I have been radicalised by rabbits very much. And it's funny how things come around full circle because we, the, some of the rabbits that we took from that place, because we didn't just buy rabbits, we did visit again when they didn't know that we were there. Some of the rabbits that we actually obtained from that place, um, there were two in particular that are named Teal and Hi-Ho Silver. And we also had their father, Gary Boosie Bunny. And does, is everybody familiar with Gary Boosie? And, and he looks really dented, like he just, just a bit skewed. This rabbit looked exactly like him. And so Gary Boosie was actually the father of Hi-Ho Silver and Teal. All three of them died of a congenital heart defect that had been bred into them because they're not designed to live a long life because they're going to be killed at between seven and 12 weeks. So who cares if they've got a heart defect? And when Teal and Hi-Ho Silver, Teal was this beautiful, big, brown, lovely boy and Hi-Ho Silver was silver. When they died, I was devastated because I thought at least I could give them a long 
healthy life and even that was taken from them. And at the Dominion March, I actually said, these industries, they will kill the animals, whether it's in the cages, the slaughterhouse, or in the arms of their rescuers. But just on Thursday, I went to the Royal Hobart Show to document uh, the animal exploitation that goes on there. Um, and we walked in and there's an exhibit with these two rabbits hunkered down in straw again, terrified, and they looked exactly like Teal and Hi Ho Silver did. And I lost my shit. And when you're actually documenting at these agricultural shows, you've got to put on a front again, just like I did in that, that flesh and fur place. You, you've got to make it seem like, oh, the animals are so cute. And instead, I'm kneeling by this cage and I'm just sobbing. And these people are staring at me like, what the hell is wrong with this woman? And my daughter, who was documenting with me, she had to pull me away because I was going to blow our cover which it did actually, as it turned out, because we got followed the entire way around and eventually had to leave. Um, but it just goes to show just the sort of the synchronicity of life, you know, radicalised by these rabbits seven years ago. And here I am still feeling those, those deep, profound effects of just meeting these two other rabbits who lived with me to the extent that I will lose my cool. And I don't lose my cool a lot. Um, well, not publicly at least, you know. Privately, it's a completely different matter. I'm an absolute mess. But, um, yeah, so that, that's basically a very short snippet of how rabbits have literally radicalised me and brought me to a point where I'm bordering on in being an anarchist. So, yep. Thank you so much for sharing that story. That's horrible. And um, I'm sure I can speak for everyone to say how grateful we all are that you were there and gave them a nice home for the time that they had and um, gave them love for the first time that they, they would never have experienced that otherwise. And we're all so grateful that you're becoming an anarchist. <laughs> and next on the mic, Andy Meadow. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thanks, everyone. And, and look, the first thing I want to do is I just want to pay tribute to these other three panellists. Um, everything that they've said strikes a real chord with me. Um, and, and, and I don't doubt that it strikes a chord with you and, and with every other person who cares about animals and, and with vegans everywhere. Because, and, and in, I want to return to different themes if I can just through this, this, this short talk about things that really strike a chord and they're resonant with me. And, and the first thing I want to talk about is, is, is Hans. And the, the very first successful campaign that I was involved in was actually around the oceans. And we had a fight um, in Geelong against a super trawler that was actually from, from Scandinavia that was then rebadged and called the Geelong Star. And this was a super trawler that um, a single net was three times the size of the MCG on a single boat. And it was fishing the small pelagic fishery. And we fought that vessel and we got it to the point where we actually had someone undercover on board who was feeding us footage and still photography and, and the animals that, that that particular vessel was capturing as, as bycatch. And we were able to force that vessel back into port three times and it was suspended three times as a result. And what happened then was that they had to leave. They had to stop doing what they were doing because we impinged upon their operations so badly that they were economically unviable. And so they left. But not before the then federal government under Tony Abbott had changed the classification of what was a super trawler for, Geelong, for, for Australian waters and changed the size. So the size had to be a vessel, I think it was over X amount of metres, and it's a huge amount. So they actually changed the classification to allow others to come in. Now, that hasn't been enacted yet, but it's there, so we have to be vigilant. But that vessel just simply left Australian waters and went to the coast of Africa, um, which is probably where you guys might have come into things, I think. But, but, and that's what I want to talk about, because as vegans in everyday life, 
we're confronted with so much tragedy. Right? Everything we see, everything we look at on social media, there's, there's so many stories that just that break your heart on a daily basis. And then you go out into the world to try and deal with that. And you go to work in your jobs. And no matter what you do, you've got people who want to run you down. They want to take the piss out of you. They want to talk about, hmm, bacon though, ah, ha, ha, ha. All those ridiculous things that people say that they think is funny, that they think they're being so original. And we've heard it all before, every one of us. And it's really easy for those things, all those, those, those pieces of horrible footage, and we need to see them. And, and in many ways, what we don't. Like, it's like Hans said, right, you're preaching to the converted, yes. But in many ways, sometimes you need to be reminded of why we're doing things, why each of us does the things that we do. But everybody else needs to see them too. But in the process, we can become so disheartened, so down, and so damaged by what we see, it's easy to just to give up on the world. And we can't do that. We have to have hope. We have to hope that we can change the world. We have to hope that people will see. And it's by work that these guys do. And I, and I, I love that story that, that Hans was saying because that, that's a victory, right? That's a victory for our movement. It's a victory for the animals. It's a victory for the world in total. Right? Because we have to then celebrate those victories. Because we see so much, so much trauma, we, we have to celebrate those victories. We have to be able to lift not only ourselves up, but every single person that we know that's in our community around us. We have to lift each other up, celebrate those victories because they rejuvenate the soul. They rejuvenate our ability to keep going, to keep doing what we're doing. And we're doing such tremendous work in so many different areas. You know, the, the work that Christy does with, with, with rabbits and, and, and with other work that she's been doing in Tasmania, the work that Hans and Sea Shepherd do, it's just extraordinary on a global scale. And, and, and the enlightenment and, and, and the, the reality that James is able to bring when he goes to these places overseas and, and shows everybody in this country that it's not just here in Australia, but it is around the world, but also here. The footage that we've seen of the racehorses, the footage that we see of the greyhound industry, the, 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 the footage that we get from slaughterhouses, everything we see here in Australia is repeated around the world and it is very easy to get beaten down. Celebrate the victories. We're here at an amazing place. This is the most extraordinary event I've ever been to as a vegan. As a non-vegan, I think if you came here, you would just walk away going, my God, what are we doing in this world? But how hopeful it is that there's people out there that understand all these things. So celebrate those victories and lift each other up because we need it. We do. So in my sphere, it is also very easy to get beaten down. And because we see... Because, and, and I always like to applaud um, everybody in every aspect of, of, of the movement because every single, every single aspect is vitally important. The education, the activism, you know, the, 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 the undercover footage, all of these things bring all of these subjects to light and they all assist. I never want to see anyone run down somebody who does something in the vegan movement ever because we're all so important to each other. Because what those people do is that they provide the people in my position the ability to prosecute the case to change the law. We can have 100,000 people in a square campaigning against a particular issue, but without changing the law, that issue is going to remain. And, that, and this is what people in power rely upon. They rely upon the power of the fact that these people might come back every year, but if they do nothing about it, then people become disheartened. And then after a couple of years, it's 50,000 people. And after another couple of years, it's 10,000. And then it's 150. And then it's 20 people. And then there's two people standing on the steps of a parliament somewhere holding a sign and someone walks past and goes, what was that? Oh, that was big 10 years ago, but, you know, no one's interested anymore. So we have to maintain that. We have to keep each other on that straight and level. And we have to recognise that all of these things, every single aspect of activism is vitally important. 
and the political sphere at the end of it, all these other things give us the ammunition we need to stand in those chambers and to argue our case, to change the law so that they can't do these things anymore. And that is difficult, right? And I talk about, I just want to briefly touch on, on self-care, and I'm the worst one for this, right? I really am. And I recognise that in myself. But that's because people like Mark Pearson and Emma Hurst and myself, we feel a great burden of, of, of responsibility because there's only the three of us, right? So, so we have to try and make these changes. And it's why we go to every single event that we can go to. It's why we speak to every single crowd that we can speak to. And it's why we try to keep changing the hearts and minds of everyone. And we don't sleep. <laughs> we don't, and we don't eat. And we just keep pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves. And it was great. We had our, uh, our national conference last week, and it was uh, the week two weeks ago. And it's great to sit together and to actually talk to the three of us and to understand from each other our own experiences and how down we get, you know, and, and, and how frustrated we get. And, and, but to, to have that little bit of camaraderie, though, to know that we're there for each other as well and we can support each other in the same way that I'm asking every one of you to support everyone else in the community as well. Because it, it can be emotionally debilitating to stand there or to sit there in those chambers and to hear that the people defending these industries that are murdering people, that's what you have to see non-human animals as. They're people. They're just like us. They are just like us. They have families. They have emotions. They, they feel everything that we feel. The only difference between them and us is that we don't speak their language. And that's all. So we have a responsibility to stand up for them. But we all need help. Mark and Emma and I are just at the end of the chain. That's all we're at. Every single one of you and every single one of these guys are vitally important. And I want you to celebrate here. I want you to celebrate this event. And I want you to just walk around today with the biggest smiles on your faces you can possibly have, knowing that in your way, in every single way, each one of us is making a difference and we are changing what's going on. It's slow, it's laborious, and sometimes, and in fact most times, you lose. But when you win, celebrate those wins. Go on social media and celebrate those wins. Let the world know, right? The biggest posts that you see on social media, the ones that get the most reactions, and, and, and James was talking about like 500,000 views and things like that, right? So I put a post up about when we exposed the Chinese businessman associated with Crown about having killing wombats up on his ranch, right, in northern Victoria. 1.6 million views. People tend to celebrate or they want to revel in the terrible things. But when you have a win, sometimes we don't do that. And for those people who are on the front lines, that can be emotionally draining. They need to feel that the work that they're doing is valuable and having that validated. And that's a really, that in some ways people may say that that's a really like a vain thing, but it's what keeps you going. Knowing that you've made a difference, knowing that you're helping these, uh, these people, that's what keeps you going. That's what gives you the ability to keep going. And you've got some great people at the pointy end of politics here in South Australia as well. Louise was just incredible at the last federal election. We need everybody to get behind her again when she stands again. <laughs> but that's my message coming here today and yesterday. I walked around here yesterday with the biggest smile on my bloody face I've had in years because it was just so fantastic from my soul to see all these amazing people and just to walk around in the public and talk, how are you going? What's your name? What are you doing here? Wow, this is fantastic, isn't it? It's great. You guys have done an amazing job and you continue to do so. Hold each other up, though. Let's, let's help each other, right? And that's really all I wanted to talk about. So cheers. Great message, brother. Thanks so much for sharing that with us all. Definitely agree completely. Um, you've got to be so grateful for every little win, and it really keeps you in the right perspective. And every single person out there fighting for change is, you know, some is they're on our side. And there's many different ways up the mountain, and it's good that there's so many of us 
taking different paths and um, doing things in so many different ways. So thanks everyone. Thank you all for your powerful and interesting uh, words. Thank you for sharing. We have a 15 minute Q&A session right now. So if anybody has any questions, I suppose I can get up and cruise up. Oh, hey, bro, I can see you. Um, so anyone got any questions? Um, sure. Yeah, I can just pass this around, I suppose. Cool. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments. <laughs> well, you're, on, you're on now, mate. Uh, questions, comments, anything you want to share, anything that came up for you during any of the talks you just heard, um, anything you want to talk about, just about veganism in general over the weekend, things you've noticed, anything at all. Oh, okay. Hans has a question. <laughs> She's saying something. I just want to say um, one thing before, just going on what you were saying about acknowledging. I just want to acknowledge Fazil over there. Thank you. Um, Fazil was the man who exposed the live export um, on the 60 Minutes. Uh, please, just, just no pictures of Faz, please. He's still getting, going court cases and stuff. So he's a little incognito, but um, Fazzy came to my ship and we had to hide him on the Ocean Warrior for a couple of months after that story came out and um, we've become best mates ever since. But Faz, amazing work that you did. And he was not an activist when he started doing what he did. He just saw injustice and filmed it. So good on you, Faz. Actually, just, oh, oh my God, like this... <laughs> I, I want to burst into tears, thank you. And I think what you just said then, you know, you were not an activist, you just saw an injustice and you took action. That's every single activist who has ever done anything. There is nothing particularly extraordinary about us, okay? Yeah, we're up here, we've got microphones, we're being applauded, you know. I'm the most mundane human, pers uh, human being that you could possibly imagine. You know, my social media might not reflect that, but, you know, I am a pretty mundane person. We are just ordinary individuals working through our daily lives who have seen some shit and didn't want that stuff to go on any longer and decided to do something. Any single one of you could do what we have done. Okay? Yeah, the, the, exactly. You know, any single one of us. So don't ever tell yourself that you cannot make change because you are powerful. And you have abilities and strengths that nobody else does. So just get out there and cause chaos with them. I've got a question for Andy. <laughs> um, I think it's a general feeling that a lot of us don't have great trust in our politicians. Have you had any wins with your colleagues since you've been in your position? Have you had any hearts or minds changed through conversations with yourself or, or have you seen any, any positive changes? A absolutely, absolutely. Um, so um, one, one of the great achievements or one of the things I'm really proud of is getting myself elected onto the board of Big Health um, and that was through having a great relationship with the, the Minister for Health, Jenny McArthrights who is an extraordinary lady. And, and, and when I get down in the chamber about all the things that are going on, I look to Jenny, right? Because here is a woman of just extraordinary resilience. And what happens there is that every time the opposition have question time, uh, their health uh, spokesperson, they don't ask questions about anything else. Their health spokesperson just stands up and fires a question at Jenny McCarthy's. And they spend hours every day firing at her and then abusing the hell out of her while she's trying to answer. Jenny has gone vegetarian, right? We gave her um, a massive big bag full of vegan cheeses because she said to me once, I cheese though, it's like, I just love it. And it's like, so we got a great big bag and we had it delivered to her office. And we have conversations in the chamber. One of the things that you might find really strange is when you're looking at, at vision of parliament while it's going on, this is the same no matter whether it's federal, state, doesn't matter. All these things are broadcast live, right? Live stream. So you might find 
people like me and I'm going over and I'm sitting with someone from a different party and we're just having a chat, people think, what are they doing? That's the enemy. What are they doing? You're not. You're in there and you're having a conversation about what policy is coming up, what's going to be debated and what you're talking about. And you're also trying to swing people to your side. Now, this is a non-animal thing. But one of the things I'm proud of, I'm really proud of, is, is, and this goes to that issue of changing hearts and minds in the chamber. So, so I, I'm a great believer in, the, as I say, when I said yesterday, like with, with, with Joanne MacArthur, like when she came here to Australia and we, talk, we spoke for hours and about this whole thing of, of we're all in this together, we animals, we're all animals and we need to support each other. And that goes across all sections of humanity as well. We enacted laws in Victoria for trans, non-binary, LGBTIQ people to change their birth certificate to reflect who they really are. We have people in our chamber who are hardline, far-right Christians who were absolutely disgusting in their behaviour and the language that they used. Some of that language, if they were to use that language in public, they would be charged under anti-discrimination laws. But because they have the protection of parliamentary privilege, they can say what they like. I was afforded the opportunity to be the last speaker to the bill. Our youngest was trans, so it struck a chord with me. But it wasn't just that. that it, it, it stretched this whole thing of vegans. We, we, we have big hearts and we stand up for injustice wherever we see it. And that's what I spoke to and I gave a 30-minute speech on that. And we the bill passed, got through. 180 people fit in the gallery of our chamber and there were about 200, they'd crammed them in. And when it passed, they, they erupted in applause. And you're not allowed to do that in Parliament, you know, you, this is the rules. And these were people that had been, so people who were gay or, and or people who were trans, who'd been fighting for this, some of them for over 40 years. Some of them remember in the 70s, they were there in Sydney in the gay pride marches when people were arrested and they were murdered and the police beat them up in their cells. So some of these people were survivors of that. And Adelaide too, I know, has a terrible history of discrimination against people from that community. And the, 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 the fights that they've fought over the years. So this was a major victory, right? These people had fought for this their lives. They were in tears. And, and it was great. But we moved on quickly to the next piece of legislation. So you've got to block this out of your mind and you move on. And then a few weeks later, I was at a summit in my hometown of Torquay with um, it's G21. It's basically a group of, of industry body leaders and stuff and government, and they come down and they talk. And the Premier was there, and he was one of the keynote speakers. And I didn't know, and they'd sat me on the front row. And I'm just sat there, and, you know, I'm talking to people, and the Premier comes up, and, and it was probably one of the most embarrassing situations in my life to have the Premier of the, of, of the state stand there and say to a room of 500 people of the general public to say, if you ever think politics doesn't matter, go online, have a look at Andy Medic's speech on the, LGB, on, on the birth certificate bill. Because I didn't know that they were going to lose that vote. And through my speech, I was able to change four of the votes on the crossbench and the bill passed. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know. But the government knew because they've got a whip and the whip goes around and tries to get people to vote for their bills. Even at the last possible moment, Ingrid's running around the chamber going, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Come on, come on, please, just, you know, you know this is right. And they didn't talk to me. No one talked to me because they knew that it was, was very sensitive to me. And to find that out was just extraordinary. And, and that goes to, like I was talking about Jenny MacArthur, the resilience that you have to have and, and the hope that you can change hearts and minds. You know? And that's what we're doing with the animal activist inquiry. I know that we've changed hearts and minds on that inquiry. I know because we've seen that we have. And I'm really hopeful that we're going to get the outcome that we're looking for. Because despite defeating that aggro bill in Parliament, it's, it's also not the end of the road. And, and, and I guess that's why I come back to that thing of, of, of holding each other up and celebrating the victories, because 
for us, it's never going to be the end of the road. There's always going to be an issue that we need to fight. And, 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 and yeah, it, it, it's great to know that, you know, and, and I came away from that not feeling really embarrassed, like to publicly be sort of held up like, because I'm like you, right? I'm just a construction worker, right? I'm a guy who's building scaffolds and dogging trains, right? And then to be thrust into this particular arena, it, it, it's, it's very different, right? And I see it as a job, and that's why I talked about coming to places like this and working seven days a week, because it's a job. It is a job. It's a, it's a lot of responsibility in the job, because I do feel that responsibility to you guys and to everybody else. And, but, yeah, I, that, that's a situation of changing something in the chamber. And, and, and I think you guys should take that away, too, that there's hope for that. And, and, and if we get other people into Parliament in every single state, then we can... We can change more hearts and minds. We can change legislation. We can get these things done. But we need, we need support. So that was a long-winded answer, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife says I'll never use ten words where a hundred will do. I've got a question, Andy. Sure. Um, what's, the, what's that animal activist inquiry thing you're talking about? Uh, right, so um, as you'll be aware, the federal government and lots of other states, Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia, have already passed legislation about, um, I, I, I'd like to change the words here, right, um, unauthorised farm access. <laughs> okay. Bloody terrorists. Better, better than terrorism, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, look at you all in your balaclavas, and I'm just, I'm just I'm shocked and stunned. Sorry, I left mine at home. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so, so they've, they've had this knee-jerk, reaction to um, whistleblowers, okay? And, and I spoke about this again briefly yesterday when I was talking about, you know, what's happened with the 7.30 report. The very same people that are applauding the people that have gotten this undercover footage are the same people that are saying, in this area, lock them up and throw away the key. So we've got these draconian laws that have been brought in. Now, the Americans started this some years ago with their ag-gag laws, right? But what's interesting is that they went so far because um, has ever heard of, anyone heard of Howard Long? Anyone else at work? Okay, cattle rancher, massive, revolutionised industrial scale cattle breeding and 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 rearing and selling and slaughter in the United States. Right, um, went on Oprah because he had a change. He he, he suddenly realised he got up one morning and looked in the mirror and went, "This is just completely wrong," and turned his life around, and went on Oprah. And, and under their ag gag laws, he wasn't allowed, you're not allowed to, in, in back then, you could not go in any public arena and even say something that might affect the industrial scale animal industries in America. You couldn't say it in public or you could be locked up. So he went on Oprah and he talked about it. <laughs> and he and Oprah were arrested and charged. And the outcry in the United States was absolutely enormous because, as you know, Oprah, she's, she's a god over there. And so the outcry was, the backlash was huge. You know, there are now only three states left in America that haven't repealed the ag gag laws. There's only three left because they've realised that it actually breaks the Constitution of the United States. So they've realised it and gone, this is terrible. And we're impinging on the free speech and the ability of whistleblowers to expose crime and corruption because this is the effect that it has. The flow-on effect, it doesn't just affect animal activists. It affects media. It affects their ability of reporters in the media to blow the whistle on things like, oh, I don't know, corruption in the banking industry, you know, things like that. They would never be able to report that. So in Victoria, we have this inquiry that the government had to support. So rather than just enact these terrible laws, the Victorian government went, no, we've got to do something a little different here, let's have an inquiry, at the behest of a National Party member, by the way. But it's backfired on them as well because there were 489 submissions to the inquiry, 64% of those were from animal activists or people who run sanctuaries, et cetera, et cetera. So all the people appearing before the inquiry, the bulk of them are from our side of the picture. And we were really clear when this came in from the start. We got a lot of information out there and said to people, when you want to put a submission into an inquiry, and this is a big great thing for you guys to understand as well, it's great to put things in that are emotional and from the side of saying, well, but, you know, what about the lives of these animals? We must consider this and that and the other. You have to understand that these inquiries are very clinical, right? 
They want to address the terms of reference. They set out terms of reference that you must address or you should address. That's what we did. We got our side to make sure they addressed the terms of reference of the inquiry. So that meant when they sat before that inquiry, they were able to answer the questions really, really, really well. And from the opposite side, they just all stood up and went, but what about the terrorists? What about these vegan terrorists? It's terrible. It's coming into my farm. So what about the kids? To, oh, what about the kids? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, invading people's homes and, and, and inflicting violence uh, on, on, on their kids and stuff. It just didn't happen. So that's that inquiry. And we think we're going to get the outcome that we want in that they're not going to be able to bring minimum sentences in and increase the penalty. We think that that's what we're going to see come out of it. So at least in one state, we're going to be making a stand to stop these draconian types of laws, and we hope that that then sets a precedent for the others to follow suit. Awesome, man. Thanks for letting us know, and hope that all the other states follow suit 100%. Does anybody else have a, maybe one last question? Just kidding. Just kidding. Fuck off. <laughs> um, all right, that's all the time we got for our Q and A. Um, so we're going to wrap it up right now. Do a few photos if anybody's interested, and then we're going to get back into partying at the 2019 Vegan Adelaide Festival. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks everybody on the panel. <laughs>